Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. Um, I hope you all had a great week. And uh, once again, you know, I see many downloads. So thank you for the support. You can find us on Amazon Music, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Pandora. Wherever you listen to your podcast, you can find us on the just type Let's Talk Micro. Um, also, I'm on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro and on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro One. So please follow me. And I always start the episode with uh, a little recap. So I hope you enjoyed the last one. Uh, so finally, we talked about all the objectives on the microscope. We went over 100x, we went over 10x, and then we talked on the last episode, we talked about 40x, right? The Hydra Eye, very useful in your analysis. Uh, and micro, very useful for motility. And I went over the wet mount. Very simple procedure where you add saline. Uh, some books say add water. And then you add your colony, put a cover slip, and look at it under the microscope. Uh, very helpful tool for motility. Remember, the movement of bacteria by flagella. So when you have bacillus versus, you know, you need to rule out anthracis. If you have a non-hemolytic bacillus, you look for motility because bacillus anthracis is non-motile. And you can do it uh, different ways. I mean, I talked about how you inoculate a, a tryptocase soy broth, and then you incubate that for 24 hours. And I've been shown that, you know, you do it like for two hours, make it heavy, and you can see movement. You know, you want to see forward movement across your field of view. And that's considered model. Once you see that, you can report your culture as bacillus species, not anthracis. If your bacillus was beta hemolytic, then there is no need to do the motility because bacillus anthracis is non hemolytic. And I also talked about uh, listeria, very important uh, gram positive rod that can cause bacteremia, stillbirth, uh, bacterial meningitis. Very important when you have a baby, a newborn, you have a blood culture that's positive, you need to roll out listeria. And you can, you know, it grows on cold cuts, so people can get it from like eating cheese, you know, ham. I think I have seen it also in like in lettuce. So you can, you get it from, you can get it from food. It's very significant. So listeria has a motility that's called like a tumbling umbrella. It's like from side to side. You can also appreciate that when you put it on motility agar, that you see the nice shape of the umbrella. You know, you stab the agar, you know, you get a colony, and then with the needle, you stab it, go down, then bring it up, staying in the same line of inoculation. And then normally motility, if it, the bacteria, you know, grows outside that line, it's modal. And then in the case of listeria, you see the shape of an umbrella. So I also talked about how helpful it is when you have white colonies, uh, let's say you're in the urine bench, you know, you have these white colonies, a quick wet mount. You can see if it's coronabacterium, gram positive rods. You can see if it's yeast. Uh, when you have alpha colonies, you know, you do a quick wet, wet mount, you can see the gram positive coxine chains. Granted, with that, you might have some difficulty sometimes. You can see the gram positive rods, the long thing rod, which are indicative of. Lactobacillus. And in that case, it will be like normal urogenital flora. So do not assume that just because something is white, it's gram positive cocci. That's very dangerous. I mean, you can make mistakes, you can get in trouble. And most important of all, you can put your patient in danger. There's different treatments, there's a different, you know, the, the significance of gram positive cocci versus rods versus yeast. You know, you treat them differently. It might be flora. Uh, you might put the patient on unnecessary antibiotic. So you don't want to do that. I mean, if the patient goes on unnecessary antibiotics, then you can still, you know, that patient, that antibiotic can start wiping some of that good flora. And that's not good. And then that, you know, makes that, you know, makes room for opportunistic pathogens. And also with the alpha colonies, uh, with the elderly patients, you know, you have you do a wet mount, you can see sometimes, you know, the coxine clusters. If you're not sure, just go ahead and do a quick ID. 
I mean, not, not quick, but you can do like a Vitek or a Molotov, whatever system you have. Because uh, you need to rule out Aerococcus urinae, which causes UTIs, urinary tract infections, and elderly patients. And it's a gram positive coxine clusters, alpha hemolytic, and it is PYR negative. If, you have, if you're following that line of thought, and if, if you are following that differential, and you have gram positive coxine clusters, alpha hemolytic, PYR positive, then more likely than not, it's Aerococcus viridens, which is, you know, flora. So that 40X is a very helpful tool. You know, it helps you, it points you in that direction. It can make your job easier. You know, you're, like I said, the urine bench. Alpha colonies, long thin runs, lactobacillus, I'm done. White colonies, coriniform gram positive runs. Okay, skin flora, your urogenital flora, I'm done. So it's a very helpful tool to have in the lab. And just remember with the 40X, your condenser and your light need to be down opposed to your 100X. With your 100X, condenser and light need to be up. So today that brings us to our next episode. And before we start, you keep wondering, you know, he keeps repeating his, himself. He keeps saying the same things over and over again. Well, that's what micro is. It's repetition. It takes years and years to become a microbiologist. So as a student, you're listening. You listen to the previous episode. You know, you listen, you might re-listen to it and still have questions. Then on the next one, you're still, okay. That's what he meant. Okay. So with repetition, you make sure that, you know, you reinforce what you're learning. It doesn't happen overnight. That's the secret to being a good microbiologist. It takes years of work and repetition. So in today's episode, we are going to be talking about biochemicals. What do we use them for? Well, it's one of the tools we use for identifying our organisms. So at this point in time, you are expert microscopist. You know how to read and report a gram stain, either blood culture or regular gram stain. Your organisms has, have been played in the media that we talked about, and they've been incubated, right? So now they're ready for us to take a look at. Typically, we look at them after they have been incubating for 18 to 24 hours. You know, we examine the agar and determine if there's growth or not. Then we also determine if it's pathogenic or not. You know, this is based on the source. Like I mentioned before, we have bacteria in our bodies. In some areas, they are normal flora. Take, for example, E. coli. You know, it's a gram-negative rod, part of the Enterobacterialis, formerly known as Enterobacteriaceae. But if you have it in the urine, it's pathogenic, right? But if you have it as a, as a part of an enteric sample, I mean, of course, you know, with the exception of a 157 and the other subtypes, then it is not pathogenic. And this is one of the things that you keep in mind when you work in cultures. Sometimes you might see these wound cultures from like an abdominal source, from an enteric source, that they are full of enterobacteriality. And at that point in time, you focus on the ones that are oxidase positive, you know, that are more resistant in nature to antibiotics. You work up like any beta strep, any staph aureus. So always keep in mind the source. Another great example is Ikenella corrodens. It is normal respiratory flora, but is pathogenic outside of that area. And then we have some organisms that are almost always normal flora, like Lactobacillus, Coronabacterium, the diphtroids. So going back to the biochemicals, you know, how are they helpful? They help us identify organisms. Organisms can have reactions to biochemicals that can be distinctive of them. For example, oxidase and the enterobacteriales. Do you remember what's the oxidase result for an enterobacteriale or enterobacteriaceae? They're all oxidase negative. That's one of their trademarks. Another example is catalase. Staphylococcus species are catalase positive. So sometimes, you know, the biochemical reactions can be enough to identify certain organisms. As long as some conditions are met. And this is what we call a presumptive ID, but I will talk about this at another episode. So we have many reactions. And if you're a student, you're going to find yourself learning a lot of them. 
So I'm going to be covering some of the most basic ones, uh, the ones that you use on your daily, day to day in the lab. Granted, you know, this is going to change. This is based on, on in labs in the US. You might have uh, certain facilities that might use some of the other chemicals, biochemicals. But the ones that are talking that I'm talking about here, they're, they're commonly used in the, in the US. When I get to the enterobacterialis, you know, I'll be talking about the, the TSI. And at that point in time, we don't use it as much here in the, in the US, but it's definitely important for you to know it if you're a student. So when you take your boards like the ASCP, American Society for Clinical Pathology, you need to know this. So I'll be going over that. And keep in mind that we don't use all the reactions for all the organisms. You know, that will be wasteful in the sense that not only it will be wasteful as far as wasting actual supplies, but you, there are some biochemicals that you don't need to do for certain organisms. But if you perform them, you have to document them. And your patient might be billed for something that it wasn't necessary. So the patient might get charged more. You're wasting lab supplies. So this is good to correlate those biochemicals to the specific organisms. So we're going to start with the first one, the most common one, catalase. What do we use it for? Well, we use it for gram-positive cocci and rods. What is catalase? So let's get technical for a moment. It is an enzyme that catalyzes the release of water and oxygen from hydrogen peroxide. How do we perform this? Well, very simple. We add a drop of hydrogen peroxide to a slide, and then we apply a colony to that drop. There's also, alternatively, you can actually add the colonies to the slide and then add the drop of the hydrogen peroxide. So I mentioned that, you know, you can use it for cocci and gram-positive cocci and, and gram-positive rods, but this is one of the main biochemicals that differentiates staphylococcus from streptococcus. So what's a positive reaction? A positive reaction is when bubbles are produced, and that's the release of the oxygen. Like I mentioned, you know, uh, that enzyme, it catalyzes the release of water and oxygen from hydrogen peroxide. So the oxygen being released is the bubbles that you see. You have to keep in mind that for a reaction to actually be called positive, it has to be a quick reaction, quick and strong. As soon as you add that drop or add the colony to the drop, you should see bubbles. And some of you students, some of you microbiologists out there already know where I'm going with this. Why you should see it immediately? Well, the reason is because, you know, enterococcus, which is not a part of the staph, it can have what is called a weak positive reaction. After the colony comes in contact with the catalase, after maybe two seconds or so, you can see some bubbles. And this is not considered a positive reaction. So you should see it very strong. Most of you that perform a catalase should see it. When you have a staph, you add that colony and right away you see the strong bubbles. So I know what you're thinking, you know, especially you students out there. How will I be able to tell this reaction? You know, I'm taking a test. Do I call it positive? Do I not? Well, this is what I, I always like to say, that you have to correlate your morphology of the organism, the morphology of the organism, to your biochemical reactions. Even if you have this way, even if you have something that's off, at least you know that you might be on the wrong track. And I have seen this, where a student is given an, an enterococcus, they have this weak reaction, they call it a positive, they think it's staph, and then they end up doing coagulase, and they might end up saying that it's a CNS. Well, that's completely wrong. Uh, you know that there's a big difference between a CNS, coagulase negative staph, and an enterococcus. Enterococcus are definitely very significant, they can be resistant to vancomycin. You know, they cause nosocomial infections. So for you students out there, take advantage of all the technology we have. I see students with tablets. Take pictures. Take pictures of your plates. That way when you're studying, you start seeing those images and you're like, okay. So you start correlating that image to the organism. Because, you know, they have staph and strep. They have different morphologies. 
you know, your staff, they tend to be large colonies. They're flat, whereas strep are smaller. They're raised. So if you start thinking about, you know, that morphology, take those pictures, you know, you're looking at them at home. At the very least, you know, if you have that questionable reaction, you look at the organism and I'm like, wait, I think this looks like an enterococcus. So it should be negative. And that way you don't end up calling it staph. You know, in, in an academic scenario, I mean, you lose points, right? So you might not do well the test. But in the lab scenario, you might end up making a mistake that might cause harm to your patient. And like I keep saying, this is all about the patients. So this is why, you know, micro is repetition, looking at things, you know, review books. With the great technology, you know, look at pictures, take pictures, review them. That way you can start getting those images in your mind. And you'll do well in school if you keep that stuff in mind. So watch out for that weak positive reaction, which is actually considered a negative reaction. So I know most of you out there, you know, tend to be the visual type. So like the flow charts are always very helpful when you're dealing with, you know, this biochemicals. So if you were, if you would have, if you're doing a, if you were doing a flow chart of your gram positive cocci, catalase will be at the top. That's the first thing you do. We do a catalase result. You know, mind you, in the clinical labs, I mean, as you get more experience, I mean, you can tell a staff from a strep. So a lot of techs, they don't do the catalase. But as a student, get in the habit of doing all those biochemicals from the beginning. And you start with catalase. Catalase positive, you have a gram positive cocci, clusters. You know, catalase positive, you have a staff. If you have a catalase negative, you know, gram positive coxine chains, you go towards the strep. That brings us to our next biochemical, which is the coagulase. So, this is used to differentiate between staph aureus, which is, if you were saying positive, you're right, and then other staph negative. So, what is coagulase? Let's get technical. Coagulase is produced by staph aureus and reacts with fibrinogen. This results in the precipitation of fibrinogen on the cell, which causes the cells to clump when a bacterial suspension is mixed with plasma. Now in your textbooks, you, you, and possibly some labs, smaller, maybe some smaller labs in the U.S., some labs outside of the U.S., if you're listening to this, they use the, the tube coagulase. I mean, I did that years ago when I was in school. So if you actually perform that, go ahead and feel free to leave some comments. Either go to my Instagram page, go to Twitter, and tell me about the tube coagulase. Please share with the rest of the audience. So most labs, they use commercial kits. You know, very simple. Uh, the one that I'm very familiar with is the Bacti staff kit, which is made by Remel. No relation to the podcast. And very simple. You know, you add a drop of your reagent, you have a car, you have some circles, you add a drop of your reagent, you mix it with a colony, and agglutination is observed, clumping. You know, the reactions can be so strong, this is true with, the, with like staph warriors, especially. Your reactions can be so strong that you can actually observe agglutination while you're mixing. And if not, then once you mix your colonies, you tilt your card, and you observe for that agglutination. You should see clumping with a clear background. Please be mindful that sometimes, you know, there are some organisms like Staph saprophyticus, Staph suri, that they can have some false reactions. So always correlate with your morphology. Like if you have a Staph aureus, Staph aureus is beta hemolytic. So if you don't have a Staph, sometimes, you know, Staph aureus can have a weak hemolysis. So if you're doing, you get this reaction and it's positive, but the hemolysis is weak. Go ahead and do an ID about another method, like the Vitek, Molotov, um, Microscap. Don't go with Staph aureus right away. So with these results, and then on a negative result, it's just no clumping. Or maybe you may see one or two with a murky background. So with these results, having met the right criteria, meaning if you have a beta-hemolytic coagulase positive, 
that's good enough to actually call it staph aureus. And if it's like non-hemolytic, coagulase negative, it is good enough to call it coagulase negative staph. But keep in mind that if you have uh, white colonies and young females, like if you're on the urine bench, you need to do an ID to make sure you rule out staph saprophyticus, which causes UTIs in young females. If you have beta hemolytic, is negative, still do an ID to make sure you rule, rule out staph lugdunensis. Because staph lugdunensis, uh, it's pathogenic. That's not to say that other coagulase negative staph can be pathogenic. Yes, they can. But normally, like staph epidermidis, staph hemolyticus, they tend to be non pathogenic, more towards like the, the skin, the normal skin flora type. So, when you have these scenarios, beta hemolytic, CNS, um, coagulase negative, do an ID, white colonies, urine bench, young female, Go ahead and do an ID by another mean, another method like the Vitek, Molotov, Microscan, whatever you use in your lab. Because you need to rule out Staphylococcus saprophyticus, which causes UTIs in young females. So there you have it. Um, so today we discussed two very important biochemicals that that's when you start at the top. Catalase, if catalase is positive, you move to coagulase. And then depending on the result, you have Staph aureus, Staphylococcus aureus, or CNS, coagulase negative Staphylococcus. So what happens, and before I get to that, so these biochemicals, like I said, bacteria, they have certain reactions to certain biochemicals. You know, they, they produce some enzymes, and then when you use, you add a, uh, some sort of a biochemical, it causes a reaction that you can observe, you know, like agglutination or some color change. So it's very important, you know, it definitely helps in identifying your bacteria. So what happens when your catalase is negative? What's the next step? We know, right, catalase positive. We think we have a staph. We do a coagulase, then we separate between staph aureus and coagulase negative staph. So what about if we have a strep? What do we do? Well, that's going to be on the next episode. I don't want to overwhelm you with too many biochemicals. And that, my audience, is the end of this episode. I hope you enjoy listening about biochemicals. Like always, I enjoy talking about them. Um, so now you know a little bit more. After your gram stains, you know how to do catalase and coagulase. You know what you have learned about them. Always keep that motivation in everything you do. All of you microbiologists out there, keep that passion. Continue working on those plates. I know that a lot of times it can be overwhelming. But it's a very re rewarding experience to see how our work helps the patients. And that's what it's all about. Stay motivated, stay safe, and enjoy your week. Goodbye. <laughs>